action video. <laughs> When the second Bali bomb exploded, Australia once again found itself on the front line in the war on terror. But for Indonesians, this was simply the latest in a long line of atrocities. They've borne the brunt of hundreds of attacks over the years, most of them unreported in the West. Once again, Australia and Indonesia joined forces in the hunt for the Bali killers. We are determined to continuously fight terrorism in Indonesia with an effective global, regional and bilateral cooperation. Tragic incidents such as this so far from driving apart the people of Australia and Indonesia would only bring us closer together. This show of unity is impressive, and it plays well to Australian audiences. But many Indonesians don't see it that way. Mengapa kekerasan tidak pernah berakhir? Mengapa tindakan teror selalu ada dari tahun ke tahun? Berganti rezim, berganti pemerintahan selalu ada. Kenapa? Karena ada semacam negara bayangan di negara ini. Negara dalam negara yang mengatur negara ini. For seven years, I've reported from every corner of this vast nation and seen firsthand the havoc that terrorists wreak. Tonight, I want to tell you a very different story about Indonesia's war on terror. It contains many disturbing allegations, even from a former president. The Australians, if uh, they uh, you know, uh, get the truth, I think it's, it, it's a grave mistake. What do you mean? Yeah, who knows that uh, the, the order uh, to do this, to do that, and uh, came from, uh, you see, within our own forces, not from the culprits, mm. from the, the, the fundamentalist people. <laughs> Indonesia's police are doing very nicely, thank you very much, out of the war on terror. They now have all the latest equipment, courtesy of the millions of dollars pouring in from the West. The money ensures the world's most populous Muslim nation remains on side in the fight against terrorism. Mastering all of this new technology represents a steep learning curve for the Indonesian police. Unfortunately, today, they forget to set up the X-ray machine properly. <laughs> Luckily, there's an old print lying around from a previous exercise. Because of the war on terror, American and Australian support for the Indonesian police has never been stronger. During Day Bakhtia's five-year reign as police chief, Indonesia endured countless acts of terror, including three major ones in Bali, then the Marriott Hotel and the Australian Embassy in Jakarta. These massive blasts might have forced the resignation of any other senior official, but Day Bakhtia managed to survive with the backing of powerful friends at home and abroad. <laughs> In Indonesia's parliament earlier this year, I found the police chief boasting about how he gets the star treatment when he visits Washington. <laughs> Indonesia's police are in charge of the war on terror. 
Years of human rights abuse by the Indonesian military, or TNI, mean it's now out of favor in Washington. But it seems the police can do no wrong. Many Indonesians would find the idea of trusting the police laughable. It's long been regarded as one of the most corrupt and incompetent institutions in the country. Former President Abdurrahman Wahid sums up what many people here believe. All of them are liars. So just to be clear, you, you, you're, you have your doubts about the police oh, yes. uh, ability to investigate properly yeah. all of this. Yeah. But none of this seems to worry Indonesia's allies in the war on terror. That's detachment 88. The police counter-terror unit, which receives a great deal of the international aid, including substantial assistance from Australia. Like the military, Detachment 88 is controversial. Its members stand accused of repeatedly using torture in interrogation of suspects. But these allegations don't seem to even raise an eyebrow. Kemarin juga Sekjen Interpol kan datang nengok apa Aceh kan, datang saya ketemu saya saat terang. Dia bilang menghadapi terorisme internasional sudah dijawab oleh polisi Indonesia secara profesional. juta euro. Untuk polisi. Kapan? Kapan? Ya, long term. Sekarang saya sudah sudah langsung ya. Itu lobinya. Denmark 500. Dari sebutnya 5 juta, kan bayar 500 sekarang kita tambah. Belanda 2 juta. Akan terus. The money is flowing like water, but outside the chamber, unrelated to the anti-terror funding, is a scene that should make donors think twice. A man from the Religious Affairs Commission sitting next door counts cash to be distributed amongst voting politicians. Call it corruption or even the trickle-down effect, but it's this kind of informal funds distribution which keeps the wheels turning in the Indonesian economy. With all the cash flying about, some politicians want to stay as close as possible to Dai Bakhtiar. With the cash cow growing fatter by the day, some analysts even suggest the police now have too much to gain from the war on terror. Yeah, betul. Agar agar Australia memberikan sebuah bantuan kepada Indonesia. Tetapi kenapa selalu akan bom akan meledak, bom akan meledak, seakan-akan pihak asing ditakutin di Indonesia. Bom akan meledak. Anda harus bantu kami dengan sejumlah uang, dengan sejumlah peralatan dan training agar kami bisa bergerak karena kami tidak punya dana untuk mengatasi teror ini dan untuk meyakini pihak asing bom meledak dan benar bahwa ada teror di Indonesia tapi dilakukan oleh teroris dalam tanda kutip to most Australians Terrorism in Indonesia means Jamaa Islamiyah. Abu Bakar Bashir, Dr. Azahari and Nurdin Mohammed Top have become household names and we're led to believe they're the masterminds behind every atrocity. But there's another side to the JI story that Australia hasn't heard and it's part of the extraordinary family history of this man. Ini Bu Foji Hasbi ketika selepas dari masa tahanan Kemudian dia kembali pada keluarga dan membangun uh, perekonomian keluarga. Lam Karuna Putra's father 
was an Achenese separatist leader, descended from a long line of Achenese fighters. He went on to become a key figure in Jamaa Islamia. Fauzi Hasbi, who used the alias Abu Jihad, was in contact with Osama bin Laden's deputy, Ayman al-Zwahiri. He lived for many years in the house next door to Abu Bakar Bashir in Malaysia, and he was very close to JI operations chief Hambali. Umar Abdu is an Islamist convicted of terrorism and jailed for 10 years under the Suharto regime. He belonged to a group that attacked police stations and hijacked a Garuda flight to Bangkok. He remembers Fauzi Hasbi as a hardliner who traded arms and was willing to commit acts of violence. Fauzi Hasbi yang dikenal oleh gerakan Islam memang pada awalnya sebagai seorang yang punya kepedulian terhadap jihad perjuangan umat Islam. Di samping latar belakang dia sebagai gam. Fauzi Hasbi was so relaxed amongst the militants and they with him that he even took his son to a critical meeting in Kuala Lumpur in January 2000 as J.I. was preparing for its violent campaign. The attendance list was a who's who of accused terrorists. Kemudian dari Bindanau, dari MILF juga uh, hadir, Ustaz Abu Rairah namanya, uh, Panglimanya uh, Abu Sayyaf. Kemudian dari Patani, Ustaz Abdul Fatah juga hadir. Uh, Dari Sulawesi, dari Jawa Barat, semuanya hadirlah dalam pertemuan itu. Itu lembaga yang dikelola oleh Hambali. Rabitoh itu artinya ikatan. Ikatan seluruh gerakan Islam di Asia Tenggara. Jadi pimpinan rapat itu Hambali? Hambali. Hmm. Hambali pimpinan rapat itu. Hambali and co. would have known their colleague Fauzi Hasbi had been captured in 1978 by this Indonesian military special forces unit but they wouldn't have known that he became a secret agent for Indonesian military intelligence. The commanding officer that caught him was Syafri Samsudin, now a general and one of Indonesia's key military intelligence figures. These documents obtained by Dateline prove beyond doubt that Fauzi Hasbi had a long association with the military. This 1990 document, signed by the Chief of Military Intelligence in North Sumatra, authorized Fauzi Hasbi to undertake a special job. And this 1995 internal memo from military intelligence headquarters in Jakarta was a request to use brother Fauzi Hasbi to spy on Achenese separatists, not only in Indonesia, but in Malaysia and Sweden. And then this document from only three years ago assigned him the job of special agent for BIN, the National Intelligence Agency. Security analyst John Mempi says Fauzi Hasbi, alias Abu Jihad, played a crucial role within JI in its early years. Kongres Jamaah Islamiyah pertama di Bogor di Puncak itu difasilitasi oleh Abu Jihad setelah kepulangan Abu Bakar Ba'asir dari Malaysia. Nah ini terlihat bahwa Abu Jihad sangat berperan sekali di situ. Yang terbukti belakang bahwa Abu Jihad adalah agen intel. Berarti yang memfasilitasi selama ini adalah aparat intelijen, memfasilitasi gerakan Islam radikal. The extraordinary story of Fauzi Hasbi raises many important questions about JI and the Indonesian authorities. Why didn't they smash the terror group in its infancy? Do they still have agents in the organization? And what information, if any, have they had in advance about the recent deadly spate of terror attacks. The Indonesian intelligence chief refused Dateline's request for an interview, and dead men tell no tales. The man who held all the secrets, Abu Jihad, was disemboweled in a mysterious murder in early 2003, just after he was exposed as a military agent. His son, Lam Karuna Putra, died in this plane crash last month. Fauzi Hasbi's death led to a flurry of speculation about shadowy intelligence links to Indonesia's terror networks. Jadi tidak satu pun kelompok Islam 
atau kelompok gerakan dan politik Islam yang tidak uh, dikooptasi oleh intelijen. Semuanya berkooptasi dengan intelijen. Umar Abdu says his terrorist group was incited to violence after infiltrators showed a letter saying Muslim clerics would be assassinated. Memberikan dokumen bahwasanya tokoh-tokoh Islam akan dieksekusi. Kami sebagai orang muda otomatis bangkit semangatnya kurang ajar. Ini tidak benar. Kita harus bunuh semua kabinet dan pimpinan-pimpinan militer. Seperti itu rencana kami. And he's not the only one who says he was used by intelligence agents. Another convicted terrorist is Tim Sar Zubil, who exploded three bombs in Sumatra in 1978. Although no one was killed, he paid a heavy price. Saya fonis pertama hukuman mati berubah dari seumur hidup. Akhirnya yang saya jalani 22 tahun. Zubil now believes he was set up by former President Suharto's intelligence agency. Kemungkinan ya, itu memang sengaja ditumbuhkan dan dibiarkan sedemikian rupa. Sehingga dengan begitu, kita-kita yang muda-muda yang masih emosinya tinggi, terpancing untuk melakukan hal-hal uh, yang melanggar hukum. Di, dibiarkan oleh siapa? Ya oleh pihak yang yang berwenang untuk melarang itu ya. Dalam hal ini katakanlah uh, penguasa ya, penguasa rejim orde baru pada waktu itu. Uh, Belakangan baru terpikir oleh saya, pada waktu uh, melakukan kegiatan itu sendiri, saya tidak terpikir sejauh itu. After Zubil was captured, beaten, and tortured, something remarkable occurred. The authorities made up a provocative name for his group, Komando Jihad. Kita yang tidak pernah berpikir untuk pakai nama itu, tapi kita disuruh menerima bahwa itulah nama organis organisasi kami rencanakan atau pakai nama Komando Jihad. Nah, ya sudah, pokoknya sekarang kalian terima saja. Nah, nanti di pengadilan kalian mau bantah, terserah kalian. Tapi ya tetap saja pengadilan uh, tidak peduli, tetap saja nama itu di, diberikan kepada kita. Indonesia's recent history of terrorist attacks began with a deadly campaign that unfolded on Christmas Eve 2000. Bombs exploded almost simultaneously at 18 sites, mostly churches across six provinces. 19 people died and 120 were injured. Jamaa Islamia took the blame. It was the first real mention of the group in Australia. But Indonesians had another theory. They suspected the military the only organization with the capacity to pull off an operation of this scale, a full two years before the first Bali bomb. The respected news magazine Tempo even splashed the allegation on its front cover as part of a special investigation. The most revealing information in the report related to the bomber's network operating in Medan, North Sumatra. The man convicted of making the bombs in Medan is somewhere behind these prison walls. Our repeated requests to interview Edi Sugiarto over many months have been ignored by the Indonesian authorities. Guilty or not, reputable sources claim he was so severely tortured before his trial he would have admitted to anything. But it's clear he wasn't acting alone. The Tempo investigation included telephone records revealing sensational information of direct links between the bombers and military intelligence. The records also show that Fauzi Hasbi, the military intelligence agent in Jamaa Islamia who we mentioned earlier, was at the center of the plot. He had spoken to Edi Sugiarto, the bomb maker, seven times and had also called a businessman well connected with the military. 35 times. That businessman in turn rang a Kopassus Special Forces Intelligence Officer 15 times and the officer had called the businessman 56 times. With Eddie Sugiarto in jail all further investigation ceased and five years on sources in Medan are too afraid to talk. The trail has gone stone cold. <laughs> Thank you. 
George Adichondro is an early riser. As Indonesia's leading researcher into corruption in high places, there never seem to be enough hours in the day. For two years, he's been investigating a terror campaign in Poso, central Sulawesi. His research reveals that terror in Indonesia is much more complex than we're led to believe. There is a mafia, you can say, a corruption mafia in, in Poso who were defending the, the interest of themselves because if the corruption link, the corruption mafia could be exposed, that means the end of their career and also the end of their additional income. Adit Chandra says this corrupt network of local government officials, police and others is using terror to protect a local racket in central Sulawesi. Uh, between corruption and terror, and there is a, a very close link because those who were carrying out the terror were paid with corruption money. Central Sulawesi had just emerged from years of conflict before the latest outrage on May 28th this year. In the predominantly Christian town of Tentena, 60 kilometers to the south of Poso, two bombs left 23 people dead. A blast that claimed more victims than the second Bali attack, but received scant coverage outside Indonesia. The first foreign journalist to arrive on the scene without any evidence at all reported Jamaa Islamia was to blame for the attack and then promptly flew back to Jakarta. Like the latest Bali bombs, the two bombs that exploded here were full of shrapnel, designed to kill and maim. The first one went off at five past eight in the morning when the market is busiest. This woman is one of thousands of Christian refugees who found sanctuary in Tentena during sectarian violence that cost hundreds of lives in recent years. A second bomb blew 10 minutes later, around 200 meters away, on the other side of the market. Reverend Rinaldi Damanik says it was placed and timed to cause maximum casualties. Reverend Damanik is a powerful figure in this Christian stronghold. For years, he defended his community as Islamic fighters swarmed in to wage jihad. I first met him at Christmas in 2001, after villages all around Tentena were razed. He was convinced the army was behind the violence and had even left a calling card. Kotak ini punya label Departemen Pertahanan Keamanan Republik Indonesia. Ada 1.400 butir amunisi kaliber 5,56 mm. Itu berarti senjata sejenis M16. George Adichondro says that in every Indonesian hotspot, the army ferments trouble by funding and arming both sides. In the case of central Sulawesi, both Muslim and Christian militia. So the money doesn't come from, doesn't, do not have to come from rich people like Osama bin Laden, and the weapons doesn't have to come from southern Philippines or from other exotic places, but it's actually uh, coming from the official sources. And that is why I'm saying that the kind of terrorism which we see in Indonesia is homegrown terrorism. It's a kind of dual function or maybe a triple function of the armed forces. The late Reverend Agustina Lumentut told me in 2001 that the Indonesian military was using proxy armies to do their dirty work. It is for sure, for sure, that the, the army is behind the jihad or in front of jihad. Yeah. No other uh, interpretation. 
it was proved beyond all doubt that one of the extremist groups, the Laskar Jihad, was supplied, transported and incited by the central government to go on its murderous spree. Who dare among them to say, stop doing that? Because they have reason for doing that, they are registered officially by the government, central government. Indonesia's president, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, is applauded in Australia as a moderate Muslim leading the fight against terror in Indonesia. But as the influential coordinating minister for politics and security, he chose not to stop the Laskar Jihad and was even supporting them. Uh, they also play roles in defending truth and justice that is uh, expected uh, by uh, Muslims in Indonesia. For me, as far as what they are doing is uh, legal uh, and uh, are not violating law, then this is okay. This was a ridiculous statement. Yudhoyono was well aware of the carnage that was underway. Since 2001, things had improved somewhat, as Reverend Damanik tells these politicians from Jakarta visiting after the May 28th bombs. But local leaders are afraid that terrorism is being used to derail reconciliation between Muslims and Christians. Dan sekarang memang luka itu sangat dalam, tetapi itu bisa ditahan sedemikian rupa. Tapi pertanyaannya adalah, ada apa di negara ini? Kalau masyarakat tidak bisa bekerja dengan baik lagi, kerjanya hanya berjaga-jaga. Apa yang kami harus kerjakan kalau cuma berjaga-jaga terus? Bagaimana negara kita ini sebenarnya? Ini pertanyaan yang saya kami pikir kami paham. Itu juga sulit dijawab di sini. With weapons handed in and a peace deal holding up well, Reverend Damanik's former sworn enemy is also very suspicious about the timing of the bomb in May. Muslim leader Adnan Arsan wonders whether the attack was designed to prevent the army from leaving. Setiap keamanan mengakhiri masa tugasnya, ya, dan ada yang berbicara kami sudah mau pulang. Ya mudah-mudahanlah tidak tidak ribut lagi. Di saat mereka mau ditarik. Ada lagi yang meledak, penembakan misterius, tidak tahu siapa yang menembak. In the days following the blast, all the big names in Indonesian security and intelligence descend on the area. Central Sulawesi Police Commander Arianto Sutadi tells me the investigation is going well. Bagaimana Pak, sudah mendekati apa, yang pelaku-pelakunya kira-kira? Ya, sudah ada yang dibagi, sudah ada yang tangkap. Then, National Police Chief Dai Bakhtiar, the man receiving all the foreign cash, arrives to assert his authority. After less than one hour on the ground, he's made his assessment. Karena itu harapan kita semua bahwa peristiwa seperti ini adalah peristiwa kriminal yang harus dapat kita ungkapkan pelakunya dan akan kita bawa ke persidangan pengadilan. Dan masyarakat mempercayakan itu semua pada aparat. Considering the evidence of corruption here and the police chief's record of enforcing justice, that's unlikely. Indonesia, Indonesia, Indonesia. George Adichondro's research has uncovered a scam involving local police who have looted up to two million dollars for the resettlement of refugees. You can say a cabal involving both the district head, the acting district head at the time. Uh, certain police agents, certain people within the Department of Social Affairs uh, and their friends. They, they, they were carrying out the, the, both the corruption as well as using that corruption money to pay the, the terrorists. So you can see we're talking about homegrown terrorism paid by homegrown corruption. He says the May 28 Tentena blasts were an attempt to stop honest police uncovering more about their scam. You can, you can say that the bombing could be, the, could be seen as the, the apex, the, the ultimate development of the kind of terror which they were committing. They, they had gone as far as um, paying police to decapitate a district, not a district, a village headman, the, the village headman of Pinadapa. The corrupt and murderous cabal identified by Adi Chondro is now suing him, and the police appear to be in no hurry at all to follow up the leads he's identified.
Instead, on his departure, police chief Day Bakhtiar offers another bland statement about the certain groups responsible for this violence. Suasana yang sudah mulai demikian kondusif ini nampaknya masih juga dimanfaatkan oleh orang-orang tertentu, kelompok tertentu untuk melakukan tindakan seperti pemboman yang tentu akan bisa menimbulkan rasa takut, rasa khawatir lagi. As Day Bakhtiar's plane heads back to Jakarta, more bigwigs arrive. Syamsir Sirgar is the recently appointed head of the National Intelligence Agency, BIN. His appearance is supposed to inspire confidence in this investigation. But BIN has a long-standing, dismal reputation in Indonesia for dirty tricks. The agency is currently fending off damning evidence that it was behind the poisoning of Indonesia's best-known human rights campaigner, Munir Said Talib. As I reported earlier this year, Munir was given a lethal dose of arsenic in his orange juice on a Garuda flight to Europe. On the Tintena bomb investigation, Sirgar has nothing to say. Pak, kalau nggak kalau nggak mau bicara ini, kasus Munir aja pak. Gimana ada hasil investigasi internal terhadap apa keterlibatan anggota bin gimana pak? Kau pak, pintar bahasa Indonesia bagus gimana kau? Keterlibatan oknum dalam bom bom tendana gimana pak? Ada kemungkinan. Kalau ada oknum ya kita ambil tindakan lah. Ya pasti ya. Pasti dong. Sudah cukup apa di negara ini. <laughs> Rogue elements indeed. Travelling with him is Timbal Silayan. He was police chief during the carnage in East Timor. He was acquitted of crimes against humanity, one of several commanders who escaped justice for orchestrating the bloodshed. Now he's officially retired from the police force. So what on earth is Timbal Silayan doing here with the new chief of intelligence? Is he just along for the ride, or is he now on the intelligence payroll? Whatever the answer, the continuing role of these same old state terrorists is truly disturbing. It's no wonder the locals are now deeply suspicious of anyone sent in to protect them. While the police can claim some success arresting terrorists in Java, in this region, results are few and far between. After years of state-sponsored terror, no one wants to help the authorities. <laughs> this woman jokes that fear of talking to the police has become a popular movement. The first real break in the investigation comes a week after the attack and leads police to, of all places, Poso Prison. Incredible as it may sound, a police forensics team finds evidence the bomb was manufactured in the workshop, used for prisoner rehabilitation. The fact that the bomb may have been assembled in a state-run facility further bolsters the central thrust of Adichandro's remarkable research, that there's high-level involvement in terror in Sulawesi. What we have found out is just the tip of the iceberg. It shows a permanent uh, a pattern which has been going on for the last five years. For the record, the authorities reject his allegations. Two weeks after the second Bali attack, and despite plenty of help from the Australian Federal Police, Indonesian authorities are still pursuing the culprits. But a familiar pattern has emerged. Asia's most wanted men, 
the so-called Masters of Disguise, Dr. Azahari and Nurdin Top, have been named as the masterminds. That may eventually be proved correct, but so far no evidence has been produced, at least publicly, to back that claim. As we've shown tonight, after enduring years of state-sponsored terror, it's no wonder many Indonesians question what they're being told about this latest atrocity. You hear, you hear again the sources, the, the statements that it was carried out by Ashari and, and Nurdin Muhammad Top uh, and a radical Muslim group behind it. Although what I heard that this actually shows uh, a rivalry, an internal rivalry within the armed forces. George Adichandro didn't provide any evidence to back his allegation. But theories like this are hard to write off just yet. Former President Abdurrahman Wahid tried in vain to reign in the military, and it cost him the presidency. In 2003, just after the Marriott Hotel blast, he was clearly frustrated by foreign intelligence claims that J.I. were to blame. They can say whatever they want, but we are here. We live here, we know them. But I will say who. But you know who it is, you think? No, no, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I said that, that means that we cannot, uh, you know, uh, uh, we cannot know the truth about that. But the, that's a problem always. But that bomb has been blamed also on Jamaa Islamia. Yeah, 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 I know. But uh, you, are, you don't have any kind of proof. But the, but uh, the people The proof were... is that the bomb, you see, uh, is similar to that belong to the police. So, mm. you know, it's a problem for us then. So, so every bomb there until now. So, what about the? It the... belongs to the government. Today is the third anniversary of the first Bali attack that saw 202 people killed, including 88 Australians. Abdurrahman Wahid now has questions about that attack as well. While some regard him as an eccentric, he is the former president and is often described as the conscience of the nation, revered by tens of millions of moderate Muslims. As such, he's one of only a few people publicly prepared to canvass the unthinkable, that Indonesian authorities may have had a hand in the Bali atrocity. He believes that the plan for the second massive blast at the Sari Club, which caused the majority of casualties, was hatched way above the head of uneducated villagers like Amrozi. Amrozi was involved in the lighter bomb. You know? That's a problem always. So who... Even though I agree that he should be given a stiff uh, uh, you know, punishment, but that doesn't mean that uh, he is not he is, uh, involved. No, no, no. So, so you believe that the, the Bali bombers had no idea that there was a second bomb? Yeah, precisely. And who would you suggest planted the second bomb? Well, uh, it looks like the police. <laughs> the police? Or the armed forces, I don't know. Wahid's speculation is chilling, and again there's no evidence to support it. But there's no doubt that he's a barometer of how many Indonesians view the whole terror campaign. This ceremony in July marked a significant moment in the evolution of Indonesia's fight against terrorism. The nation's most senior police watched as their chief, Dai Bakhtiar, was replaced by General Sutanto, touted as a clean skin. Following his swearing in, he made an impressive start, launching a high-profile anti-drug campaign and promising to crack down on rampant corruption within the police force. But for now, he's getting familiar with the rhetoric required for the job. Dan kita saling tukar uh, pengalaman dengan negara-negara lain supaya upaya dalam penanggulangan terorisme ini bisa efektif tentunya. Gitu. But it's not the experience sharing with other countries that matters. 
Like every police chief before him, he will only ever play second fiddle to the army and will struggle to control the cabal of rogue elements who still wield massive power here. Abdurrahman Wahid says that no policeman would dare to properly investigate repeated allegations that their big brothers in the military are involved in the terror campaign. They know uh, it's against, uh, you see, uh, what they do uh, was against, uh, you see, several, uh, you know, senior officers, even of the police itself. Hmm. <clears throat> so they don't want to be involved. Because, because of the fear, of the fear of what, of their senior officers that are are involved in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the moment, it's the police who are receiving all the equipment, support, and training to take on the terrorists. At the opening of this multi-million-dollar training facility, which is part funded by Australia, the Indonesians were keen to show off their skills. The war on terror has brought the two nations closer together, but any Australian concerns about corruption and human rights in this new partnership appear to have been put aside for now. But the Indonesian police's leading role in the fight against terror may be about to change anyway. In the wake of the latest attack in Bali, President Yudhoyono has taken steps to rehabilitate the military's tarnished name and bring them back into the counter-terror drive. For those who risked their lives opposing Suharto's brutal military, it's a disturbing thought that the retired general, President Yudhoyono, known in Indonesia by his initials SBY, may be ushering in a return to those bad old days. Now, General SBY himself, and he doesn't like to be called General SBY, he likes to be called Dr. SBY, uh, has, has made the statement that, yeah, uh, the, the military is ready to help, uh, to assist the police in, in, in chasing the terrorists. In other words, the military is looking for an alibi for a reason to re-consolidate their power as during the Suharto period.